I'm Linda Keaton, Executive Director of Sonoma Valley Museum of Art, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for our curator's talk, featuring our guest co-curators, Kajal and Shelby Graham, and our honored guest, Richard Mayhew. I want to thank our exhibition sponsors, Diana Budd and Jim Bertelsman, Kimberly and Simon Blattner, Anna Francis, Jeannie Walker Harvey, Sherry P. Hughes, Linda Jessma, KHR Family Fund, Ian Mayhew, Scott Mayhew, Leslie and Matt McQuown, Anne and George Ewing, Elaine Graham Smith, Dana Simpson Stokes and Ken Stokes, Lisa R. Taylor, Judy Lesvidas, Boots Whitmer, and Robert Steiner. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> Raymond Saunders on Freedom and Trust. 
right here at Sonoma Valley Museum of Art. She's currently teaching a class called Careers in the Creative Economy at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Shelby has known Richard for about 20 years. It's my honor to turn it over to Shelby. <laughs> Florence, Italy. Okay. 
He actually bought a painting of mine when I was probably 20 that still hangs in their house in San Francisco to this day. And you know, with that money, it allowed me to study abroad in Italy. And that was the first time I really kind of expanded my vision and opened my mind to a larger world. I traveled all around Europe and was exposed to that history and tradition of painting. And Richard also studied at the academia as well. And that left a profound impact on his vision and his practice, as it did mine. After that, so I spent a year in Italy, I came back, and then I decided I wanted to get an MFA was important. So Richard encouraged me and actually advocated for me to go to Hunter College. That's where I did my MFA, where Richard actually taught at in the 70s, I believe, and was one of the founding faculty members uh, at Hunter College. So I was in New York for about 12 years. Then I came back to Santa Cruz in about 2020, and Richard gave a talk, actually, um, about Spiral in downtown Santa Cruz, which I attended, and that's where I met Shelby. And that's sort of like the organic nature of this relationship that I wanted to convey here. So Shelby, maybe you can speak a little bit about how we all met, and then how the show came together. I think I should actually share one more thing. I wanted to do a show with Richard in 2002. I wanted to collaborate with him. And COVID hit, and then everything kind of shut down. So I kind of already put this out there. And it's actually really wild to sit here in front of you all in this show and see it all come together. So it was something that I had been on the back of my mind. And to see it actually materialize here is something that's really special to me and incredible. And I just wanted something that brought me closer to Richard to go through this experience and allow it to almost kind of culminate into this. Yeah, so I'll just pick up uh, um, about a year ago, Richard gave a beautiful talk on Spiral that's in Santa Cruz, and um, at the end of the talk, he said the most famous artist in the room is that gentleman back there, and he was talking about Kajal, and I said, I need to meet Kajal because he's so close to Richard. And at that time, I had been invited to um, curate the exhibition here at the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art, and Richard Mayhew. And I thought, I really need to expand the vision and really focus on Richard's mentorship, his, his profound impact on so many people. And so we invited um, Kajal to co-curate this exhibition. And from there, we both have learned so much more about you. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, you know, this concept of mentorship. And we can talk about- um, How we met. <laughs> yeah, that's how we met, right? Um, why, um, why is mentorship important to you, or who are your mentors? I knew more about him before I met him. And the fact that everybody was talking about this young man you gotta meet him in terms of how unique he is as an artist. And I said, oh, I'm looking forward to it. So I, I knew more about him before I met him. And so I was very impressed by him, and more so than what they said about him. I, but actually, meeting him was quite different. He's really, uh, very strong, very sensitive, and uh, I, I don't think he really knows how good he is. <laughs> and his, his paintings are amazing, and as far as they are, I hear nothing about this, this young, young man. It's the future. And I looked at his up and I said, he's the future and the present. <laughs> right. You know, Mom, my, I, I, I create portraits almost done in older Renaissance style, dating back to the 15th, 16th centuries. So people often ask, well, what's the relationship because Richard paints these kind of color field landscape painters of the paintings? Now, I believe painting cannot be taught. Richard didn't teach me how to paint, but what he did is he taught me how to see. And I think that's what was really important. Yeah, well, why don't we talk a little bit about seeing and, and color and um, the importance of studying in Europe, the, uh, studying abroad. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, how did studying abroad affect your art? 
We study abroad did mean maybe more concepts of American honors, but also the group that was, I met later in terms of a uh, uh, spiral group was much more advanced than they were saying they uh, were. They were unbelievable. And uh, what was going on in Europe was in terms of a transition of interdisciplinary study. And I, when I came back, I brought that with me. And nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> in fact, I got high, I got fired from Hunter University <laughs> because uh, I was teaching interdisciplinary study. And they didn't understand what I was doing. Later on, all the students picketed it. Why did get rid of me? <laughs> And I heard a story when you were teaching at Sonoma State University. He, he was teaching a, an art painting class, and next door they were um, playing some jazz music, and people were, were dancing. And instead of um, having it be distracting, he invited the dancers into his art class and started projecting the slides on the dancers. And can you talk about interdisciplinary studies? about in your interdisciplinary studies with dancers and artists? Oh, yeah. I was involved with interdisciplinary studies. I worked with dancers and musicians, where the uh, dancers would uh, orchestrate the musicians, and the musicians would choreograph the dancers. So I had this interrelationship going on, and I used that track slides to be involved with the interrelationship between the two groups musicians and dancers. And I, I gave a series of lectures and demonstrations using the group. I'd like to do it again. If you invite me, I'll do one right here. <laughs> <laughs> Can we maybe talk about that concept of the creative continuum? How you describe uh, creative consciousness? Outside the box. Yeah, so how do you teach students to think outside the box? They don't put outside the box. In the first grade, they put you in a box right away. How do you learn what you should know and everything? In ABC, one, two, three, four, you're in the end of the box, and it never lets you out. <laughs> and I was trying to get people in the college level to get out of the box. <laughs> you're trapped in the box. There's no future. You reach this end of the box. That end of the box, and that's the end. And instead of going beyond that, going beyond the box. So I was trying to get everybody outside the box, <laughs> which is very difficult. <laughs> it's hard to teach. I don't know how many of you are painters or artists or creative people, uh, but us artists, we spend most of our lives in the studio. So if you're not an artist, you might not know what it's like to spend your life in a box studio creating art. Richard, can you tell people a little bit what it's like to have a studio practice? I'm sorry. Can you talk about life in the studio? About what? Life in the studio. Creating art in the studio. I don't know. Study? Yeah. Study. Sorry. Yeah. Right. How, how to study, how you paint in your studio, the isolation. You're a traditional artist. You're a traditional artist. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing very well. So I'll make up every stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about your studio practice. A studio practice? Yes. yes. How maybe how do you start a painting? Well, I started painting, I think it was about seven years old. My grandmother taught me being well with doing drawings. So I used to do it on uh, bread and paper and uh, new uh, boxes. And uh, that was my beginnings. And then how about now? How, how, how do you go about starting a painting in the studio? So I made later on, then they looked like it was my future. I had no idea about that. I used to draw all the time on everything, everywhere. I didn't do it on the wall, so. <laughs> <laughs> my future was uh, set up very early, because uh, my grand, my uh, grandmother used to bring home 
books on the arts. And on Paula Magazine, which is still being printed now in Europe, it was one of the first magazines I read. It was a Paula Magazine. And it was involved with the arts. I, when I started looking at that magazine, I didn't read that well. I was very young. But later on, I realized that was my mentor. It started in terms of the development of consciousness and in this very uh, thinking, uh, inventive creative thinking. So I went down a road of inventive thinking and creativity as being the everything. So I express it on the students. You are inventive creative person. And everybody, they really don't know that they are. There's great writers out there that don't know that they're great writers. Great musicians among you have never picked up a horn or played a piano. But this is that ingenious sensibility that many of us never get into. And the uniqueness that who you are could have been one of the great ones in that area. You never know, because you never went that way. Didn't know about the inventor, creative person you are. When a child is born, it's like fighting the, to live, right? And that's the inventor start, should continue to go that way. But they don't get the children going down that road. And the schools don't do it either. They box you and put you in a box and you don't get out of that box. <laughs> Even later on, in, in, inside that box. And never going, being, going to the edge of the box to go outside, the inventive. I show up on this audience, some of the great scientists are right in the audience here, never went that way. Great musicians, you all sitting out there, didn't know what he, and excellent artists, I can see something over there. <laughs> It never became an artist. But the advent of sensitivity was always there, but never used it. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, could be one of the great inspirations for, for all of us. But you never went that way. I you look at several faces out there and say, you, you could have been the one. <laughs> you could have been that genius that it, it stimulated us to it. Or the fact that you come and see my show. I'm just another, I remember as a little boy, <laughs> wanted to enjoy painting and drawing. It was a joyful encounter. <laughs> and that's still the way I feel about when I paint. It's, it's a creative adventure. It's a joy. <laughs> and uh, whatever comes out of it, Sometimes I don't know because it, it has its own uh, development, which is part of a feeling. All of these are supposed to be <coughs> landscapes or tree shapes. They're mindscapes. They're based on the mental sensitivity of time and joy and love. And that's what my babies are. They're mindscapes. They're not landscapes. That tree is just another symbol of which everybody enjoys, but never responds to, oh, that's my tree. No, they don't say that. <laughs> Let's talk about inside. Inside. Yeah. I think these are some of the things that uh, I find really interesting about uh, Mr. Mayhew's work. Hold it down a little bit. For now. Something what I find inspiring about Richard Mayhew's work is that it, that they're not part of any one historical movement. They're not Barbizon school, they're not Hudson River school. It's not quite abstract expressionism. It's not quite colorful painting. It's something of all of the above, but none of them at the same time. Um, so that's something that I, I really, uh, I'm attracted to with his work. Um, and then coming up with the title of the show, Inner Terrain, that's exactly how I saw the work. The titles are a little tricky thing. They're always some, some of the most difficult things to do when it comes when it comes to a show. Um, but it was sort of self-evident in his work. I do see his paintings as an investigation of his inner terrain. 
there's a few quotes that he says that are on the walls. So he says, I'm not outside painting, I'm inside painting out. When I'm painting, I go into a trance. I lose uh, consciousness of time and space. I really like this almost like shamanic quality of painting where you're kind of entering <laughs> into another dimension, pulling from that dimension and kind of manifesting these feelings and emotions um, on two-dimensional surface. Yeah, do you want to talk about memory, your, your painting yeah. from, from inside, the inside of the painting? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not hearing very well. <laughs> I got here, here, uh, help us here, but it's not, so I'm missing some of the interest change. <laughs> and uh, the inspiration I felt when I, when I went in, I met Chanel, <laughs> because there was a, a special uh, uniqueness about his work, which is not the images he was doing, it was just it's the creative natural mannerism, in which is, you really see with a lot of artists, writers, and composers, they don't really reflect that sensitivity of uniqueness. And he, he has that. And if one has it, should not really know about it, and just let it happen, right? <laughs> and there's a, there's a special instinctive creative sensibility that he has that comes up when you go to his studio and see, actually see his works. So you can't hear what I'm saying? No, 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 you're good. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah? Okay. I'm just saying, see how clear he talks? You guys are muffled. That's why he can't hear you. That's why he can't hear you. Not hearing it? No, we, no, we, we can hear, yeah. Well, okay, oh, okay. We, we won't use the mics, we'll just project. Uh -huh. um, right. So we talked a lot um, about this, this idea of painting from memory, and, and this is not your neighbor's tree, this is you know coming up from years and years of you, of your memory, you driving across country, um, seeing um, these views and putting them together. I drove, I drove across the country from New York to San Francisco, six times and how much each time I came across the country I saw it completely new and different and how I saw it before in terms of the landscape or how many people live there are certainly spaces in the Midwest nobody no houses no nothing and I was shocked because in Europe everywhere you go there's houses and there's people but here, there's a whole space that I drove us three or four hours. Nobody, no houses, no nothing. I said, whoa! <laughs> Even the landscape was actively moving, and people were there, but nobody was there. So I thought of uh, how special, unique nature is, and uh, how much nature is involved with reinventing itself. <clears throat> and how much uh, certain groups in terms of survival is reinventing themselves. And that's what's happening in, in a, a unique new people coming to an area. They're reinventing themselves because they have to learn to live this way or that way. Or the people that are already here always don't realize who they are. And that's very difficult to say. They identify with a certain religious group or a certain family group, but that's not who they are. They are unique, special people, beyond the norm of the family or friend or education. And their uniqueness doesn't get up in terms of some creative aspect that they have in music or in writing or in the art or painting. There's a uniqueness there that everyone here has that never use it. I look at different places out there, you are a genius. Do you know that? Do you know that you're a genius? Let's go back to the uniqueness of your life. You have to tell me somebody else. Maybe we can solve it. I enjoy the input of the 
sensibility and then she was a speaking of your sensibility his unique paintings speaking of your sensibility you know when i look at your paintings one of the things one of the things i love to do um when i go to museums and look at people's work is kind of reverse engineer the technical process uh, of painting and when you look at richard's painting there's this process of layering stumbling painting over erasing scratching out um, I always joke with Rosemary, where she'll walk into the, the studio and, and she'll think, oh, the painting's done. She wakes up tomorrow and he paints over the whole thing again. <laughs> so this whole like, notion of kind of stop and when to keep it, you know, prodding at the painting. Uh, but also just the language of, of, of paint that Richard's been working with uh, is something that I, I find really attractive uh, with his work. Also, of course, his use of color. Yeah, and here in the back hallway, we have um, a color theory wall on, you know, both color wheel and optics. So, um, you know, Richard did his uh, master's thesis on color theory. I mean, he really is so knowledgeable about color and just the way he'll juxtapose colors that are not normally there or having, you know, a red tree. Um, so we could talk a little bit more about color or well, also optics. You also mentioned you're very interested in optics and how the eye sees and um, you know, how shapes play roles and how shapes have memory and things. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, nature has these emotions. Do you want to talk about you know, optics and color? Well, that's what I said. Anybody in this audience could inspire me in terms of sensitivity that is rejected when, when you encounter many people. He's always an inspiration for me because he's involved in a new adventure in his work. He's constantly redeveloping the, <laughs> the image. And, uh, and I remember about his work, he was the, uh, I guess, the, the future of American artists. And they said, we, well, who's the example of that? I said, he, he is the example of that. You see, he is work. He's the example of the future of main artists. Well, this is what I do. Because they, one, when they don't know how good they are, you know, they, they, they excel that way. <laughs> well, you were such a support to me uh, in the earlier stages of my career. I think we also want to know who supported you and who inspired you. Who were your Who were your mentors? Huh? Who were your mentors? Who were your teachers? George Innes. George Innes. Um, George Innes was a landscape painter, but he painted the soul of nature. So if you look at uh, George Innes, it's involved with the sensitivity. It's a mood space rather than a landscape. It's a mood space. And it's how much I, I, I try to do that with, with a tree. How much that is a particular feeling that you have, whether it's a color or a shape. So the shape of the tree is suggestive of movement and, and, and feeling. Right. And we have an example of George Innes' work on the timeline. In the back hallway, we have a beautiful timeline that um, was designed by both um, Ina Mayhew, Scott Mayhew, and, and Zach Fishman um, here um, at the Venus Center of Manhattan Gallery. And that really kind of shows his early influences and how um, Ina's really, um, one of the quotes on the wall is about how um, Mayhew was inspired by the mysteries of, of Ina's uh, landscapes. Uh, we also have, we have a couple more questions, go ahead. You want to say something? Um, we also um, know that you study, you know, or you had mentors in Spiral. You worked with, oh, with Spiral. Yes, you worked with uh, Norman Lewis, Charles Alston, Hale Woodruff. Uh, can you talk about those? Well, when I went to study in Europe, but when I came back, I met a group of artists, which well, I didn't realize they were going to be my future. 
Carl was involved with a group of others that came together to fight omission and denial. They are Frank and others. They were not included in any exhibition or anything. Which is really in 1916, no women were in any museums or exhibited or even <laughs> respected. So there was the omission and denial of people. And in 1960, I don't know if all the women here know that. They were not included in any museums. They were not uh, exhibited. There was no support for them at all in the 60s now. That's how recent that is, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the women got together then to fight omission and denial. And so was minorities at the same time. But they were part of a minority and didn't know it. <laughs> and uh, what, what did you discuss um, in some of your spiral talks? Did you have, um, you know, you talked about creative consciousness and what it was like to be an artist? Spiral was the uh, <laughs> unique body of artists. They were very bright and very brilliant, and no one paid attention to them. They were not, they were not included in a lot of main <laughs> exhibitions. And uh, someone says, well, how come None of the minorities were included. You have to realize in the 60s, no women were included. In 1960, all right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So there was that omission of African-American and minorities at that time. In the 60s were, were also minorities being denied. Right, so the thing that was fascinating for all of us about Spiral is it just opened up larger conversations. So it really was, um, you know, a great uh, a movement and um, Richard is the last surviving member of that group. Um, so we can talk a little bit more, um, you know, just about, um, you know, just your life as an artist, what it was like to be, I mean, you've been a selling artist, like a successful artist in all your galleries. What was it like to, um, just make so many paintings and successful artist. Successful artist. You are a successful artist, my friend. <laughs> well, I, I don't Tell see us. myself as being successful in that respect. I respect a lot of other people. And I can see as a very successful artist. How much how many people do you know that? He is really exceptional and unbelievable. If you see his whole series, he's online, so you can see his work online. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's got a lot of that. Can you tell me a little bit about mine? Richard's like, you know, Richard was alive for a lot of extremely important movements in American history. I mean, you know, fought in World War II. He, you know, was part of the civil rights movement was happening when he was a part of Spiral. His work, there's no political or over political messages or meanings in his work. It's fairly like non representational in that uh, instance. Um, so, in that sense, he has been sort of to a degree like underrepresented or possibly even like misunderstood uh, because of that. But as a younger artist, that was something that I found to be like really refreshing. And as I look back at history, there was this kind of political divide where a lot of African were encouraged to participate in the, revo the revolution uh, at the time. Um, but I still see that even though Richard's work isn't politically overt, maybe like Reginald Andrews' work was, or Romare Bearden's work, or maybe Benny Andrews' work, for example, it's still there for me. It's still you know, who he is. And there's still that, that honesty and that truth there, even though it's not overt. So for me, again, that was something that was really refreshing inspiring for me as an artist, where I could do something similar, where it wasn't in kind of an overt, I'm going to beat you over the head with the politics. It's something kind of more subtle, something more subdued, a slower beat. Um, so at the time, being another artist, that was something that was really uh, inspirational to me. It allowed me to kind of just be myself. It almost gave me a permission to explore and express and create what I was kind of true to me something that I've held on to during this artistic journey, 
because especially coming up in New York, it's so easy to get swayed by the market. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. it I had many opportunities to pander to the market and create a quote unquote product that has already been tested, and I didn't do that. And a large part of that, me following my own voice, was being inspired by Richard. Space 
and emotion. And usually it ends up just emotion. Right. And like in, in his paintings, there's certain sensitivity of, you are always seeing what, and looking at his work, but the feeling of space that's in his work is very unique, very special. Can you, talk, can you talk about jazz or music influence in your right. work? To the jazz influence? Improv. Yeah, tell us more about improv or your Most of my training is improv, because I used to be a jazz singer. All right. Oh, 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 oh. in the middle of a painting and it'll change in terms of color or shape right in the middle of the painting is a feeling of space and time reinventing itself at the moment so I let it happen <laughs> and uh, so there's earlier paintings you've seen me like the one in the Trench America building, and they were bird free. They've been there since 1965. And they're not allowed to be taken out of the building. So nobody ever sees them. <laughs> and on the observation deck in the Trench America building. <laughs> and they're very free technique in painting. That uh, I, I don't think the electrical that's, that's on the uh, the observation deck, yeah, and they don't let you cope anymore because right. some of resentment of the corporation. Someone came up and and took cut up all the furniture and the paintings at the time. Wow. So one of them sliced one of my paintings has been repaired, but you can still see where. Someone did that. <laughs> we, um, anyway, we have um, just a few more minutes left to talk about um, Richard's fabulous work, but we, um, we, we would like to open up to a few of the audience questions, and we have uh, Mikey can um, pass around the mic. If there's anyone that has any burning questions that you would like to ask Richard, and uh, I'll wait till I see Mikey coming over. Uh, is Mikey here or maybe Annie? Um, let's see if Mikey left the room. Um, maybe Donovan. Donovan is available. Right. Yes. Well, yes. Happy over coming to you. Let's see like the microphones are helping. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So I want to know, how do you know when a painting is finished? I know what she's saying. How do you know when a painting is finished? Painting is never finished. <laughs> it's like I took the composer. I said, when you finish that music, he said, it's never finished. He goes on to the next new composition. And so, it's a way I feel about a painting, it's never finished. It inspires the next one. It's an inspiration. I think it was Cezanne who said, artists, we don't finish paintings, we abandon them. <laughs> Definitely feels like that. Yeah. Next one, another, another question? Yes. Can you hear me? No. And I'll repeat. Go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you. Go ahead. How, I'd like to know how your heritage affects your paintings, your heritage. My ancestry certainly affects it. I'm Native American and African American mixture. All right? So the Native American affected me very early on because my grandmother was Shinnecock Indian and she was constantly involved with me to work in, with the, uh, the sensitivity of that feeling, of that culture. So everyone, it comes out of the work. I don't know, I let it happen. It's not a question, but just a statement. I appreciate your non-conformist approach to, yeah, I'll, I'll to you. painting because in society, you know, it's easy. It's easy to 
conform to what's going on around you. And he was around with the civil rights movement and all of those things. So I appreciate that because it does inspire the next generation to not conform. Uh, she says she appreciates that you're a non-conformist. You, you paint your own style. Right. right. Any thoughts on that? Painting your own your own style. Well, how much I'm involved with inventive space, and it's a feeling that happened on the canvas. There was no intent in the beginning when I saw the paint, and there's this inspiration that shows up in development. Like inspiration of, of his work, it might inspire me to do a certain thing. But nothing to do with this way he's painting. It's part of an inspiration. And he, he's that way, I think, with a lot of uh, students or people in the arts would look at his work. And there's a certain mood sensibility that shows up in the painting, which I and unless you send them to the earth, you'll miss it. And see what a great teacher he is. He's so great. Um, in fact, it was a joy to curate the show with Kajal because whenever we would visit Richard, uh, Richard's eyes would just light up and sparkle when he would, when Kajal would enter the room. So anyway, you are a great inspiration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question? I thought I saw. I think I'm Go ahead. Like the, uh, there was 
Garazio paintings. There was no orange in the painting, but a lot of white costumes, right? And he had a lot of blue in there, and in the white costume, you say orange. Right. So, how about, do we have another question? Because I remember your image. Yes. I think I have one. So, I learned all about understanding how to use color that way. Thank you. And by eliminating one of the colors of the, that color, and you'll see it even though it's not there. So I, I learned how to use color and uh, how it affects one mood consciousness by looking at it. How, how about your move to California? Does California light affect your color? When I came to California, I, I drove across the United States six times. Three out, three over and three back from San Francisco to New York. And as going back and forth, I was looking at nature's unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> so that's where I got a chance to see it. But also, the color from one area, but what if they put across the country? I feel that California has all its rare factors the rest of the country has. It has a desert, it has a great forest, it has lakes, it has rivers, it has an ocean. So I said, wow, <laughs> California's got everything. <laughs> they even have people. <laughs> Donovan, did you have a question? Did you have another question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Mayhew. Um, yeah, you know, I can't hear you. Well, well, well. Your, um, do you listen to music while you're painting? Do you listen to music while you're painting now? You know, I was a jazz singer, so improv is always there. And in melody, a lot of classical music is involved with a lot of strange, innovative sound space. And I remember a lot of jazz composers used to use that, of the classical music, subtle tone changes and how they create a certain illusion, feeling, and mood. So a lot of jazz musicians are based on classical music using certain tone changes, sometimes abrupt, sometimes very subtle changes, and creates a certain mood space. So I know Duke Cullerton used to use this composition by using classical music and jazz combination and getting subtle strange effects of style. So I was trying to see how that shows up with with images, alright? And to say the shape in, in, of images in terms of color difference. Two dimensional illusion is based on very simple structure. Circle squares and drive red, yellow, blue, that's it. Everything is just a combination of that. So, and how much you can use just a very simple change. A, a curved line is advancing space. A straight line is distance. And, and the triangle is pointing, right? So you got these big basic shapes in any composition is suggestive of how that form seems, right? And then the same thing with color. You use, like in a painting I have red, you, you'll always see his compliment even though it's not, not there. The compliment show up on, on the wall next to it or something. You'll see his compliment. So there's this eye and mind knowing what's going on. But many times the mind didn't, was never taught to understand what the eye is seeing. So at the academia in Florida, I learned about what the eye is seeing, how much the mind understands what the eye is seeing. And so that was a, a development for me because we were out completely lost before that. I had no idea. <laughs> the mind understood what the eye is seeing. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you.
that's why his work is fantastic. How about one more, one more question from the audience? Can we take one more? Is there one more? Otherwise, um, could y'all go ahead? Yes. yes. This is not a question, um, but I, I do think that um, even though you're saying that Mr. Mayhew's work is not political or radical, but I think that it's a very radical act to become creative and be an artist when you're a person of color, particularly at the time when you started making art, and then to connect with the people in the spiral who were politically motivated, and the whole idea of omission and denial is a political statement. It's a political statement, and so I think that also the idea that Mr. Mayhew is looking at the landscape and talking about mind and optics, is also radical because a lot of people criticized him because he wasn't making overtly political imagery. And here he sits, he's the last man standing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.